Hello, everyone, um, dear partners, um, colleagues, friends. Welcome and good morning, afternoon, or late evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Alexander Nikodinovic, and as communications officer of the IUCN Regional Office for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, I'll have the pleasure to be your host today and moderate the discussion. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar on ELANS, a tool for easy access to Earth observation data for environmental lawyers and decision makers. The ELANS portal was de developed to break down the barriers related to access to satellite data by non-Earth observation experts. This event is organized by IUCN uh, with the support of the Consortium Partners of Environments, a Horizon 2020 research and innovation project funded by the European Union. We have a great group of experts joining us here today. And as people continue to arrive, and before we get started, just a brief overview of how this session is going to work. The webinar will begin shortly with introductory remarks followed by the presentations from Environment partners that will demonstrate the portal's beta version and share two examples to show how Earth observation data can assist with the investigation of illegal infrastructure developments and deforestation monitoring. After this, we will open the questions and answers session. We will hear the opinions of our three discussants before opening the floor for your reflections, comments, and questions to speakers. Whenever the stage allows, uh, we will spotlight for you the vis visual graphic recording of the key messages shared at the webinar, uh, the work being done by Katie Chappell. At any time during this webinar, you can type in your questions for the speakers using the Q&A function that should appear at the bottom of your screen. Kindly indicate if your question is addressed to a particular speaker, if your question is selected, we will share it with the panel on your behalf. Please don't use chat function to send us your questions, although you should certainly use it for comments, feedback, or to see the links uh, to additional resources that are being shared. Finally, kindly note uh, that this session is recorded and will be made available for the public on the Environment's website and IFCN YouTube channel within the next few days. You might want to share it with some of your colleagues interested in the topic, but not able to join us today live. With all that said, uh, let us start uh, the webinar with a question we are proposing uh, for you uh, via the Mentimeter that will help us to get to know you better and learn uh, something uh, about you. So uh, please um, follow the instructions on the screen. Um, go to menti.org and use the code 45539983 to tell us where are you joining us from. I will allow for a few moments uh, for, for people to access the website, enter the code and uh, share their uh, responses with us. Um, let's, let's see, um, is the technology on our side today? Uh -huh. First answers are uh, coming in. Thanks everyone for uh, participating. From Germany, Wales, Croatia, Serbia, Mexico, the United States. South Africa. Wonderful. Let us maybe um, close this question and um, move to the next one. Using the same code, uh, please um, tell us something about your background. What is your professional background? Oh, 
Well, I see that the result is pretty um, uniform. Oh, we have a representative of the private sector, but um, a bit stronger um, participation from uh, biodiversity and conservation uh, side. Thank you. It's always interesting to um, and engaging to see this kind of um, interaction. Thank you. So um, going back to our program, let us um, give the floor uh, to our first speaker today. It is my pleasure to inv invite uh, Dr. Alejandro Isa, head of the IUCN Environmental Law Program, uh, to share his opening remarks. Dr. Isa, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Alexandra, <clears throat> and a good day to all of you, dear colleagues, dear partners, and thank you for joining us today in this webinar, which is part of a Horizon 2020 project, EnviroLens Copernicus for Law Enforcement Support. Allow me to give you some background on why, in our view, new technologies, advances, including in the field of Earth observation, have such a great potential in the field of policy and legal relating to the environment. Environmental policy and law play, as you might know, a critical role in protecting ecosystems and habitats and preventing biodiversity loss throughout the world by way of regulating human behaviors. Environmental law <clears throat> is only effective if enforced and violations to legislation are detected, reported, and persecuted. For this to happen, reliable, accurate, and timely data is required. Earth observation can provide the necessary information when supplying historic and current frequently updated data. But this data has not yet been utilized fully in its full potential. In addition, Earth observation can significantly support monitoring efforts, often hampered by inadequate human resources, time, and the remoteness of areas required to be monitored. Some of the violations are discovered too late, they remain undetected, and thereby prevent crime persecution and prosecution. Environments aims to contribute to address these challenges and provide the officers, the legal practitioners, the public authorities, and the not-for-profit organizations, among others, with the tools to prevent environmental crimes and also monitor changes. In a previous webinar that we had with you a few weeks ago, or months, I don't even know when it was exactly, because time is running so fast, we focus on the legal aspects relating to the use of Earth observation for environmental law compliance. We learn that environmental law does not directly regard the Earth as a whole. So integrating satellite data into our work leads us to rethink the ways in which environmental law as a discipline was conceived in its first place. It can help us to better understand the interconnections between the systems and the challenges and challenges us to rethink the normative dimension of the protection of the environment, create a framework that reflects the reality of transboundary challenges and the connectivity of ecosystems and habitats. The environment, the environment portal, as you will see again today, is only a first step towards the use of the power of combining environmental law and earth observation technology. We hope that the practical examples will give you an impetus to realize how these two distinct fields can work together to prevent and prosecute environmental crimes and help to better understand the causes and the effects of environmental changes that should shape legal reform. IUCN, as a member of the EnviroLens Consortium, is one of the pioneers 
of these technologies. On behalf of the Environmental Law Center in Bonn, I wish you all a very good webinar and a fruitful discussion. Let me thank the, the European Union especially for making environments possible and to all of you for your participation today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Isa, for uh, setting the stage with initial thoughts as to why new technology, technological advances, including in the field of Earth observation, yield such great potential in the legal and policy arena, and specifically when it comes to environmental law enforcement. Uh, let me invite now our next speaker, Mr. Boris Erg, uh, Director of the IUCN Regional Office for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, to share his opening address. Uh, Mr. Erg, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, dear participants, um, uh, wherever you are and in, in, in whatever time zone you are, uh, I really welcome you to uh, today's uh, today's workshop, and it's really uh, it's great to see so many joining joining our our webinar today to present some of the results of the uh, Environlens project. Um, I can only build uh, coming also from IUCN. I can only build on uh, Alejandro's words on why uh, why these new technologies why the, the environment portal and earth observations are really important. Uh, for us as a IUCN, a global knowledge-based organization, um, uh, new technologies are uh, provide a vast opportunity for, for, for embarking on new horizons and tackling some of the key challenges that we are uh, facing today. We know that we all are in the same boat and, and in quite uh, dire straits um, as we, at the moment, uh, uh, cope with uh, with multiple crises and try to try to uh, address and, and and mitigate them, including the climate, the biodiversity, and most recently, the health crisis. A 2018 IBIS report suggested that it's close to 75 percent of land on Earth that's being degraded. And we know that uh, that it's uh, around 50 percent of uh, of wildlife being lost uh, over the past 40 years only. So there's a massive challenge, and it's a it's a massive task uh, ahead of us, as a, as a billions of people being uh, being affected by these uh, uh, by these uh, developments. Uh, in order to get our house in order, uh, we need new, uh, not only new policies, but we really need, need new tools. And, and this is what Earth Observation and this is what Environlens is providing. We need a user-friendly, accessible information close to real time in order for us to improve uh, decision-making, planning, action on the ground, uh, and monitoring. And this uh, this project uh, and and its uh, and its results come very timely as we do in, indeed embark on a very ambitious future. As we know that uh, the the European Union um, launched a uh, uh, its biodiversity strategy, the Green Deal, setting really ambitious ta targets, uh, uh, raising the bar to thirty percent of land being uh, and and marine realm being protected, um, including some strict protection. And we as at IUCN, we are having that discussion at the moment, what strict protection would really mean. Uh, the President Biden uh, has also uh, launched new initiative of uh, aiming at 30%. And uh, in few months time, we will have two key events, the IUCN World Conservation Congress and CBD Convention of Parties, which will seal the deal in a way, aiming at 30% by, by uh, 2030. And it's not only to protect, but it's also to effectively manage. And this is exactly where, where Environlens comes in and, and Earth Observation to provide new tools and new opportunities for us all uh, to engage and, uh, and contribute to that agenda. We've seen multiple ways of how to use this, this, this data, satellite imagery, um, uh, being applied across numerous uh, multilateral agreements, World Heritage, RUMSER, CBD, different conventions, uh, climate change and land degradation. What we need more is to have more real-time data that we can monitor what's really happening on the ground in order to improve, because that's, that's what, uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what counts. Um, 
Uh, in closing, I would really like to thank all the partners um, who have participated in this uh, joint endeavor. Um, of course, uh, in particular to, um, to thank the, the, the European Union and the Horizon 2020 program for uh, enabling us um, to uh, implement this project and hopefully um, uh, bring about uh, an interesting and very useful results. Uh, with that, I wish you all a very uh, informative and uh, dynamic webinar and fruitful discussions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Eric, for stressing that Earth observation can inform and support biodiversity conservation monitoring, help us achieve the regional and global conservation targets, and um, of course, improve decision making and monitoring when it comes to the management of natural resources. Let us now start diving deeper into the work and results of uh, environments. I would like to invite my colleague Alexandra Ibrahimova um, from ICN Regional Office for Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Alexander Schultmeyer from DLA Piper to tell us about the project, um, its background and the context it operated in. Alexandra and Alexander, uh, please take the floor. Thank you, Alex. Uh, today, I indeed want to start with a short presentation of the background of the project first, uh, because it helps to, uh, to understand better the context. Just a few words about it. The main focus of EnviroLens is on legal compliance and support of decision making with uh, accessible data, for example, for monitoring. It aims at bringing um, Earth observation data closer to legal sector and environmental uh, policy sector, NGOs and other actors. It facilitates um, our access to the satellite data and its understanding and gives information on the environmental incidents. Uh, as the results can then be used to guide and support the decision making. The project is implemented by a consortium of partners with Joville leading on uh, ELAN's portal development and coordinating all the parties. Uh, Joseph Stefanis worked on data semantics with ELAN's minor and legal discovery tool. We will see this uh, a little bit later in the further presentations. Synergy is focused on earth observation tool set uh, while Aristotle University of Thessaloniki Alf, was dealing with earth observation modeling and essential variables algorithms. We at the UCN and DLA Piper are contributing by demonstrating and validating the value of using Earth observation data in the environmental law and policy areas. The main technological deliverable of the project is eLens portal. Attention, the project is called EnviroLens, but the portal's name is eLens, just not to confuse this. Um, it's available for use in beta version through controlled access. Later, our partners, Geoville and GSI, will present the functionality of the portal in more detail. So what kind of data is available through eLens? Uh, it's basically the links to legislative acts, satellite images, and the results of uh, the service uh, uh, from processing of the images, the satellite images. And this data could be used uh, both by NGOs and in-house legal departments and public authorities and private sector uh, and uh, also law firms. Uh, the decision makers are often facing the challenges with the access to the data due to, for example, the scale of the area and the time limitation and of course the financial uh, side as well. And this is where the Earth Observation Data Any Lens portal can help um, access the information from remote areas. Let's say the forests that are poorly accessible to remote to large. Of course, different actors are facing slightly different issues in their work. And uh, now Alexander from DLA Piper will cover some of the issues and opportunities typical for the legal sector. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra, and also warm welcome from my side, representing DLA Piper and um, let's call it a private legal sector and covering law firms and trying to cover in-house um, in sector as well. So what you see here is a slide um, which we prepared just to show you the range of ELANs and what its capability is or are. Um, and we pulled together like three um, use cases we thought um, would make our lives in law firms and hopefully also in the other legal sector easier. 
So what you see, um, we covering environmental impact as assessment studies, which if you look at the timescale of a project, and we're also looking, always looking at projects from um, law firm side, would be like the beginning or even prior to the project. Um, then we would have the force majeure events, which would be deep in the project and covering the contractual phase of the project itself. And then the pipeline project would usually uh, I will explain um, the projects in detail, but um, would be in the end of the project, um, being even after the contractual phase, just as a monitoring tool. So <clears throat> coming back to the EI assessment, um, why is it in, important for us? Usually um, the EI is really at the, the initial phase of the project, even before construction and so on starts determining um, what or where the project area is which means that this is a phase where the client itself would, would do this exercise without legal law firms, because usually we, we can't contribute to this point. But um, using Enrival Lens and especially eLens and the monitoring tool, we could um, proactively, uh, proactively assist um, at this point because we can contribute our legal assessment of the pictures we see. Usually we would be the ones getting pictures at a later stage or getting information at a later stage. And via um, EnviroLens and eLens tool, um, we would be able to actually proactively um, impact um, the client and ideally simplify the evaluation of the um, project um, areas, which would also lead to a streamlining of the process. Similarly, but a bit differently, um, if you look at force majeure events um, in, contract, in contracts, are usually the ones heavily um, discussed and negotiated, especially if they happen, because party A is claiming it happened, party B is claiming it's not happening. And usually you have a huge problem with the evidence and, and actually proving um, that it happened or not happened. If you look at um, environmental um, issues or let's say uh, floods, fires, and so on, um, eLens would hand us a tool to actually have evidence and proof when it happened, where it happened, and to what extent it happens. So this, in the end, would help us develop a contract management system because we can teach the system to learn what if for if, if, if force majeure events it should look for and actually um, implement an alert system. Using this, we would provide automatically evidence for contextual negotiation for the client, which again, would be beneficial for um, saving resources, saving time, and the, what's the most important thing for all the clients, saving money. Um, similar ideas apply to the pipeline project monitoring, where you would look at um, the, um, um, the, the stake of the um, pipeline and seeing if, if it's affected by natural um, disasters or something like this. Um, and again, the events tool um, with the monitoring possibilities would allow us to effectively um, and easily cover these grounds um, by not um, heavily um, relying on, on, on ground personnel, but rather on satellite images, which would quite simplify um, the approach here. And again, um, this would enhance our reaction possibilities. And again, by using a developed alert system would save time, money, and resources. Please, the next slide. Um, I don't want to um, dive into too deep into this slide, but um, what we tried here is just to show what are the benefits from, for in-house legal departments and um, law firms. And it basically also um, covers what um, Alexandra said before, you would, you would save time and free resources for other purposes. Um, it's just a simplified and easy monitoring and access tool, which hasn't had before for the legal sector. It's a new tool for us. It's quite interesting and fancy, and we are convinced that it helps us um, simplify our daily work. And of course, again, mentioning that um, time and money will be saved, which is important and maybe the key asset for our clients and especially the in-house uh, legal department as well as law firms. And this concludes my one, uh, my presentation, Alexandra, back to you. And this happens when we, we are so many uh, Alexandras Alexanders. <laughs> so yes, thank you. Thank you very much for introducing uh, violence to our participants. Um, I would like um, 
now to go back to the Mentimeter uh, and uh, ask you uh, the next question. Um, and this is, uh, for what purpose have you used or would use uh, the Earth observation data? Uh, to answer this, um, you can see information on the screen. I will also copy it in the in the chat box. Um, and this time we are using a different code. So uh, please go to uh, menti.org and use the code uh, 26268155. This is really interesting for us just to see um, uh, how well um, our um, participants today here with us um, experienced with the Earth observation data and um, how, how would they uh, envisage its use uh, in the future, maybe in their, in their work. So we have the first answer, which is a uh, reporting on environmental crime. Thank you. Let us maybe allow for a few more uh, seconds. Uh, we see pollution control, monitoring, um, vegetation mapping, land use mapping, um, middle infestation mapping, water quality monitoring, mm -hmm. land use changes, monitoring change in land cover, cover and wildlife movement tracking. Very interesting. Thank you. There are so many replies um, showing up. We see again uh, the law enforcement and uh, protected area monitoring mm -hmm. policy making and monitoring under multilateral environmental agreements. Illegal land use changes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I hope you also find um, this kind of interaction uh, rewarding. I do certainly, and I'm sure that we will uh, find uh, this uh, feedback received from you today very, very useful and um, be able to apply it in, in, the, in the next steps uh, when it comes to violence. Thank you. So let us move on. Um, uh, with the, uh, the program, it seems to me, and I'm sure that everyone agrees that we are uh, more than ready to proceed with the portal demonstration. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mario Doher and Carl Stepar from Geoville, uh, as well as Eric Novak from the Josef Stefan Institute to tell us about the portal uh, system design, the ELANS minor system, and uh, wrap up with saying uh, where we are when it comes to the portal's future or what comes next. Uh, Mario, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you all and welcome you also to this webinar. Uh, my name is Maria Dohr and I'm the, the project manager from GeoVille in this project. And I want to say a few words basically about the portal itself uh, before we get a, a, a short in video where we can see the functionalities and get some deeper looks inside from, from our colleagues from GSI. Okay, um, the portal itself uh, is available at the moment, as I said, and as I said before, it is in a beta version. So uh, what is this, this portal, what is the use of this portal at the moment? For from the project side of view, yes, it is an important output of the project, but it also serves as a tool. And what is this tool? This tool is to get a better connection to all the users we, are, we have in mind and, and to generate feedback from the users because one of the biggest challenges in, in projects like this is to make the awareness in the user of the possibilities, but also the limitations of it. And most important, how can he use these opportunities and possibilities this, all this satellite data is giving into his daily process. So to reach the people now and the main output of the project should really be to, to see where the future goes what are the possibilities and how to integrate such things. We, we made this portal and we designed this portal 
to be as user friendly as possible from our point of view at the moment what we know and to give users and people the opportunity to to dive into this information technology to to gather to to make experience and to share that with us and therefore we made uh, uh, this portal and and we we're really looking for all the informations feedback from you what to improve what are the really the needs of of, our, of the of the end users and how can we support them with the functionalities so this is what the portal is really useful for at the moment it is a tool to generate exactly this information so what we uh, developed here in this portal are mainly three services one is this legislation discovery tool which is uh, a tool for searching legal documents through geographical input uh, and, and link this all together and uh, i don't want to go too much into detail because eric will show you a lot more of that but this is it's currently we are using the the ulx database that covers the the european only but uh, as you will see it can be very easily linked to any other database later on, depending on the needs of the customers, the feedback of the users. And, and uh, as you will see, it's very easy to expand this. Uh, we have the exploration tool, which is mainly the, the entry point for the most of the users. This is a very easy and user-friendly tool to compare two timeframes uh, with satellite images in, as I said, very user-friendly environment. This is mainly the thing people use first to get a first impression and then go one step further and use the more complex monitoring and alert tool. So this is, is a tool which gives you the possibilities to, to automatically monitor selected areas for specific events, may it be deforestation, may it be a uh, water level, which means floods, may it be illegal constructions. And you can do both. You can make an alarm for, for automatic alarm if something happens in the next few weeks, next few months, you can send an, uh, an automatic process that you get automatically alert if something happens. But you can also, of course, take a look in the past, can make compare things if you want to see what happened between 2018 and 2020 in this area on a, on a monthly basis and see changes which are maybe slightly uh, happening in this phase so this is this is the, these are the three tools and now i want to give a little bit more detail about the the, the how we designed the system we designed the services to be as user-friendly as possible but we designed the portal itself to be as flexible as possible. So this means it mainly exists of four building blocks, which is which are really quite independent working from each other and are, are connected via the, the, the ELANS portal in the middle, the yellow, the yellow uh, uh, block. So this is the portal, it connects us together. So for the legislation discovery tool, we use the ELANS minor system together with the portal to give you the service. For the exploration tool, we have the portal and we have the Sentinel Hub here, which gives us all the, the, the EO data information. And for the monitoring tool, we have these advanced services uh, methods integrated, which gives you all the, the possibilities to generate or um, monitoring and alert for, you, for your regions. So what is the, the, the great benefit of a structure like this? It means if we see that we have to adapt the, the methods, we can do this independently in the, in the method block. If we see we need different data, we can do this in the, in the, in the Sentinel Hub or, or anywhere else where we need additional data. If we see that we have to expand the legal database, we can do this in the ELANS minor, and this all without touching the rest of the system. And this gives us the opportunity to, to, to be prepared for the future to, to react to the feedback and to adapt the whole system in a, in a, in a very fast and, and without big effort according to what we will get from your feedback back and what we will see that you will say this would be some, some real use case and how and if you integrate this or that functionality, this possibilities, we can do this in a, in a quite easy way. 
So these are the, the, the main reasons for, for making it, it in, a, in this uh, building block system, which gives us these opportunities. But uh, enough talk for me. I think we have a short video now ready, which shows you in a, in a fast way, we'll guide you through the functionalities of the portal. As I said, it's, it's, a, it's a quite short video, but it gives you an impression of the possibilities of the portal. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, I wish you have fun with the video. Welcome to the eLens portal. Let's dive into the first eLens tool, legislation discovery. Select the area of interest. You can choose different layers of the map here. For example, protected areas. Select the area of legislation of your interest, such as deforestation, and hit search. It gives you the list of available documents. You can access the complete document by clicking on it. Now let's look at the next eLens tool. The exploration tool works with satellite images. Again, select the area of interest. We are looking at Buna River, located between Albania and Montenegro. This important bird and biodiversity area was affected by a flood in January 2021. To see this, we'll choose the period between December and February. To define the clarity of your image, you can adjust the cloud level up to 100%. You'll see a number of satellite images that you can select for comparison. By comparing the two different time frames, you can clearly see the change on the ground and use it for decision making and awareness. In this case, the flood is clearly visible. Let's look at the final eLens tool, the monitoring tool. This highlights the change on the ground but is difficult to see on a satellite image. Select your area of interest and save it by giving it a name. The pop-up menu allows you to choose between services and define the monitoring period. In this case, we select the surface water extent. After submitting, go to Change Detection Results. Choose again the Area of Interest and Service. When you see that the service is successful, you can check the results. In this case, you see the increase of water in the area in red. You can also schedule monitoring. This tool is useful for long lasting changes like infrastructure development or deforestation. In order to set up the schedule, select the area, service and date. You can select the frequency of monitoring and the threshold. When there is a legal construction in this area that is bigger than the selected threshold, the tool will send you an automatic alert. Okay, so uh, hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is uh, Eric Novak. I come from Slovenia, Jozef Stefan Institute, the Department for Artificial Intelligence. And I'm going to talk about the ELENS minor system, which is used in the legislation discovery tool. So um, if you go to the next slide. Um, Sorry, can anybody hear me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so the motivation for developing this, uh, the inland spiner system is basically trying to answer the how to support land monitoring with legal documents. Um, and we found a solution that is in two parts. The first one is uh, the so-called labeling pipeline. Uh, which extracts and understands the content of the environmental legal documents, as well as the link, um, as well as it links the documents to geographical areas. And the second part is the search engine, which enables searching through the documents based on the user query. And as Mario mentioned, it is uh, both 
the query can be both text and uh, geo information. So on the next slide, we're going to see the architecture of the uh, labeling pipeline. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, what we do is we use artificial intelligence to extract uh, and enrich the document. And we try to understand, but, and by extracting the information uh, within the document, this information can be named entities, such as uh, names of organizations, people, locations, uh, dates, and so on, as well as high level concepts, which we link to the Wikipedia pages. So we use Wikipedia to understand what is the topic and what is the document all about. Um, and using this, we can, uh, we can then extract that uh, the document is talking about the deforestation or flooding um, and so on. So once we extract this information, we use label data sets to, um, to fit these documents into particular domains, such as environmental and uh, geographical domains. Um, here, we then do a matching between the extracted, in, extracted information with these labels. And uh, once we match them, we, we can then have a list of uh, labels or a list of terms which give a high level overview of what the document is all about. So on the next slide, we see um, here we have, so the, lab the label data sets that we use are both environmental and geographical. So for en environmental, we use the Informea ontology, which contains environmental terms and the whole uh, hierarchy. While the, for the geographical data sets, we use uh, Protected Planet, which is an online interface for the, world, um, uh, for the world database of protected areas. So with this, we know which areas are protected, as well as the NUTS um, hierarchy, which is a system for dividing up the economic territory within the EU. So with this, we are able to extract the content from the documents and we have a high level overview about uh, the environmental and geographical areas and domain, um, geographical and environmental areas uh, where the document um, is, uh, for which the document is relevant. And then in the next slide, uh, we develop the search engine where we then push all of this metadata that we extracted into the search engine and enable the user to find documents based on the user query. Additionally, we add um, an additional machine learning layer, which is called uh, query expansion. And it is a process of modifying uh, the original user query to produce better query results. And here we use the so-called word embeddings, which uh, contain and which can be used for um, finding similar terms based on the, its semantic and syntactic meaning. Um, the whole search engine is uh, built on top and using uh, industry standards. And uh, with it, we, if you go to the next slide, um, we develop this microservice, the ALENS minor system, which is integrated uh, into the ELENS portal. And if you click, so with it, we, with this system, we are able to extract and understand the content of our environmental legal documents, as well as another click, um, link the documents to the geographical areas. So in a way we were able to achieve the goals uh, and um, of the, um, of designing this system. But there are still some challenges that we need to address. So if you go to the next slide, the main challenge is acquiring, acquiring the legal documents. First off, we focused on the legal, um, the, the environmental legal documents, which is a subset of the whole data sets of legal documents. Um, for this to retrieve all of this um, data, we would need to develop a lot of like an army of crawlers, which, which are uh, small processes uh, for acquiring this kind of data. And additionally, we are not able to acquire all of the data because of the legal and uh, yeah, because of the legal restrictions. Um, and another thing is the documents are always changing. So one document becomes invalid because it is replaced by another document. And we would need to find another way of how to uh, how to get the up to date document metadata to, so to put it in our system. An additional challenge is uh, to have a deeper geo-information extraction uh, 
process. So with the process or with the pipeline that we, uh, that, uh, we presented, it is able to identify locations, but it is usually some like a bigger entity such as a country or a big city, but it is not able to identify smaller areas or villages. So with this, we would need to find out how to even have, um, have a more in deep understanding and extraction of this kind of information. And additional research interests, which are more tailored to the user, um, user demands um, is rule extraction, which is finding patterns or rules within the legal documents to support the monitoring of, uh, for the cases uh, that the user is um, trying to cover, as well as using state-of-the-art text processing models. So when this project started and where we are now, a lot of methodologies and the whole natural language processing landscape changed. So we would need to find a way of how to use the state-of-the-art method, uh, methods to, um, it, to be integrated into the eLens minor system. Um, so yeah, this is everything that I have to present. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, now we would like to invite Carls to, to share um, his, um, his inputs on, on where we are with the, the outlook of, of Environments as a, as a project. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, hello to, uh, to all our participants and thank you for the opportunity to explain the exploitation uh, strategy of Environland, especially after the conclusion of the funding phase. So um, just a quick introduction uh, from myself. Uh, my name is Carlos de Barth. I work for Geoville uh, with my colleague Mario. I'm more focused on the business side of, of the projects. So very briefly, I'm going to present in a couple of slides uh, what is the consortium strategy for uh, continuing this project to a commercial service. This first slide gives you uh, an idea of the evolution of the different tools that are used in this project, in this portal. Uh, the EnviroLens project is an evolution uh, drawing from uh, heritage uh, projects such as Sentinel Hub, Perceptive, Perceptive Sentinel, uh, et cetera, and has achieved or will achieve by the end of the project in June this year, a TRL about seven, which means that this is a demonstration system that can be run and is actually running, as you saw in the video, in an operational environment, but only at pre-commercial level. Uh, so the question here is, uh, what does it take to bring EnviroLens to a fully commercial stage with both a strong uh, technology push and market uptake to ensure uh, sustainability in the long term. Uh, so basically there will be, or we see, we see this happening in three phases. Uh, the first phase is the continuation. The consortium members um, have committed to uh, some resources for the next uh, 12 months, one year after the funded phase. Then uh, the consortium has also has um, uh, looked at different uh, funding opportunities to operationalize uh, the outputs of the project. So that being that means uh, bring uh, technology to a uh, TRL uh, nine in order to have a commercial, fully commercial service by by twenty twenty four. Thank you, Carls. That sounds very exciting. Um, I'm sorry to maybe interrupt you a bit here, but we are kind of a bit um, um, getting short with time. No and uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's um, it's an um, interesting overview, of course. And um, also, I wanted to, to thank uh, Mario and Eric for, for, his, uh, for his inputs. But uh, yeah, being cognizant of time, I see that we are kind of um, 
some 20 minutes delayed, so we need to um, get back on track or at least try to, uh, to allow also for some discussion and exchange uh, towards the end. Um, so uh, next few slides and uh, let's say the, the, the whole session will take us uh, through the, the showcases that we have prepared. So it's, it's really um, a demonstration on, on real examples of what, of what the portal can do. Uh, these showcases rely on historical data uh, and monitoring capacities of the ELANs, and they aim to show how Earth observation data can assist with investigation of illegal infrastructure developments and monitoring of deforestation. So um, I'd like to invite now um, Alexandra Ibrahimova uh, again, and this time with Christine Mayer uh, from IUCN Environmental Law Center to, to take the floor and take us through this uh, interesting showcases. Um, Alexandra, please. Actually, it's me starting. <laughs> ah, it's yeah, um, but that's okay. Please. Um, thank you so much um, for this. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, now uh, we would like to to show you um, two showcases that uh, can demonstrate how, in a real life situation, you could use um, the Elens portal uh, for the case of uh, illegal infrastructure development and one deforestation case. So we have already seen that um, satellites can provide a lot of data, but uh, to use it, of course, we need to really define what are we looking for and uh, what do we want to monitor. So the first uh, showcase uh, looks at the Porto Skadar Lake development, as well as the White Village um, infrastructure development in one of the uh, protected or yeah, nature parks in Montenegro. Um, you can see here that uh, the park is quite uh, large and the uh, Skarda Lake is actually the largest lake on the Balkan Peninsula, which you can see is uh, bordered with Albania, but we focused uh, for this uh, particular case only on the Montenegrin side. So the, the park uh, was established in 1983 as a national park under IUCN uh, protected area category number two, but has also then um, been, so to speak, promoted also as an internationally important bird area and also has been designated as a Ramses site as well as uh, a candidate emerald site. So you can see that it's quite an important um, hotspot for biodiversity. Um, especially because you can find a lot of very famous uh, flora and fauna. Um, it's, the area is a feeding and resting site for over 280 species of birds. And many of them are actually listed in the annexes one and two of the Bern Convention, which for this particular showcase is quite important. And I will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the areas also hosts Quite a lot of plant species, almost 2,000, and uh, has is especially known for for the otter, which is almost endangered, um, but is is quite important for that area. Um, as I said, um, it's quite important fact that Montenegro is a member of the Council of Europe since 2007, which also means it's uh, a signatory to the Bern Convention which is the convention that um, protects uh, European wildlife and natural habitats. So why is this important? So recently, or well, a couple of years ago, um, plans appeared for a new resort development called the Porto Skadar Resort. And you can see here um, what it's supposed to look like. And uh, these plans uh, were developed back in 2014 and was supposed to be a luxury resort uh, right at the shore of Skarda Lake. And as you can see, um, here are again the, the boundaries of the, uh, the protected area. And you can see actually from this image quite well that the development falls right into the boundary of the of the protected area, um, and this is this is very much uh, significant for our case. 
since uh, we believe that there might be some um, danger to, to the species and the biodiversity in the nature park. Uh, it's also really interesting, you can actually, and everyone has access to this, go to Google Earth and very much see what the, the developments look like and how advanced they are and how much space um, they're taking. Um, but of course, these images from, from Google Earth, they don't really help us with an analysis because they don't tell us when, when these constructions started or um, the kind of time series that, uh, of events that happened. So this is where then the ELENS uh, portal can come in to help us make sense of the case and, and analyze it a little bit more in detail. But uh, before, we, before I go in more detail on, on the ELENS uh, tools, I just want to highlight again a couple of events uh, that are relevant for this case. So, uh, in 2015, after they announced that these luxury resorts were meant to be built, uh, building permits were, were issued. And in 2016, also building permits for the, uh, the very nearby white village at the same time. Um, but then actually before the building work started, a complaint was submitted under the Bern Convention uh, by an informal citizen group. Um, this was in June 2016. And one year later, in 2017, the European Parliament actually issued a resolution um, also asking Montenegro to protect uh, these, uh, the ecological characteristics of Skada Lake because it is a very important site uh, for biodiversity. Uh, however, as we know, uh, building works started anyway, and then two years later, after the building started in 2016, um, the Bern Convention actually issued a recommendation in 2018 and asked uh, for all these constructions to be halted uh, until a proper um, risk assessment has been carried out on the environmental impacts. Um, now, what we can see then when we go to our interface and into the exploration tool uh, is the following. So you would go into the tool as you saw in the video and select your area of interest as you can see here and then do a search. And then you get a couple of images. So I wanted to see kind of what was the, the sequence um, in terms of like a time series between 2016, when the first complaint was uh, made by the informal citizen group up until the time when the recommendation was made. So this two year, two, two year um, gap between the complaint being filed and the a recommendation being made by the Bern Convention. Uh, so you can see here how it, how it developed from there being nothing to some construction and then a lot of construction. Um, so what, what we can see is actually that this is a really good tool to see what, what is going on and whether uh, things are changing. And it can really help you then take action in a timely manner. But uh, what is even more interesting for us to understand from a legal perspective was to see what, what happens, what happened after November 2018, when under the Berne Convention, the recommendation was made to halt all activities. So again, then I went back into the tool and you can see this is uh, the image from November 2018. And then I took a, a date uh, the year after in 2019 to see uh, whether the, um, the building construction has actually stopped and Montenegro has complied with the recommendation or not. And we can see actually that there was more construction. And it was not just in the, as you can see here, in the Porto Skardar area, but also the White Village, which was pretty much 
not there at all back in 2018 was also developed further. Now, this case is actually still open. So in late 2020, the Standing Committee of the Berne Convention uh, issued another um, progress report and said that uh, this, this issue is still open and again urged the Montenegrin authorities to halt any developments. But as we can see, it has already advanced quite a lot. But these kind of tools can really kind of help to make the case of what happens at what time to make sense of um, the sequencing of events, give you some sort of time lapse. And at the same time, you can also use the, the monitoring tool to check your results that you saw with your naked eye. And here you can clearly see the monitoring tool also detects um, changes that happened after November 2018, after the, the recommendation was made. And uh, this concludes uh, this uh, showcase. So I will hand over now to Alexandra to uh, tell you more about the deforestation case. Thank you, Christine. The next showcase that we would like to share is related to deforestation detection. We have connected um, to our colleagues at Yoruba Natur to define the case where we could test the capabilities of the portal to detect the deforestation and logging. So for this one, we took the case of logging in the forest of Barno Repede, please forgive my pronunciation, near the city Yashi in Eastern Romania. The next slide. It covers uh, a large area. It's more than 12,000 hectares in um, well, otherwise quite modified landscape of Eastern Romania. Despite being the Natura 2000 site that is listed in both habitat and both directives, the area receives very little formal protection, um, also from the management activities, namely logging. The site is uh, divided for the logging plots, and these operations don't always respect the conservation recommendations for the area. So for now, there is no actual management plan of the area, and only 1% of the whole territory is under, uh, is under protection against logging. Next one. So as I said before, this area represents one of the uh, last large forests in Eastern Romania that has extensive stands of ancient beech and oak trees. It is also home to 116 species of birds and other planted animal species, including rare, threatened and endangered species. It also is very important for people who live nearby because it's only five kilometers away from the city of Yashin. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Due to 99% of the forest territory being allowed for logging, the Romania government uh, forest administration or Silva has authorized logging in this forest. And it was of course, uh, potentially destroying the habitats in order to produce large amount of woods in the next 10 years, which in 2020 led to NGOs starting the campaign against such actions. Um, also, a lot of local families went to protest against um, uh, these actions in September 2020. The next slide. In order to understand the scale of logging in the location that we received from the partners, you can see the coordinates there. We first went to exploration tool and checked the series of images, um, comparing them against uh, each other. Uh, there, we didn't know exactly when the logging has started. Uh, so we were looking for the signs of it on the satellite images. So when did it start first? So in the time series, um, you see the unlocked forest in April 2018. Then on the pictures in March, we already saw the forest that is locked. So we went back in February uh, where we could see some developments already going on uh, here in two, two sites um, and it started in February. Um, click next. So this is the picture of, uh, of the forest in April 2020. There are a few sites that you can see with the bare eye that are logged. And uh, the next one, the next one is just a comparison uh, in the monitoring tool. The deforestation change detection that I said between September 2019 and April 2020 showed the results of, of the change that happened uh, in a, this more sophisticated tool that is monitoring. The algorithm uh, wouldn't be able to identify the removal of um, 
each individual tree separately. Rather, it is set to define the larger areas being cleared, and it can serve as indication for NGOs and activists about where the change is happening on the ground and to inform the actions uh, to, uh, to send, the, um, send the volunteers patrols uh, in that area if they see the change. In this case, the alert tool that exists on the portal could potentially help. I didn't set up this uh, as the change happened in the past, but if I had done so, it would send me a notification with indication where the change is happening. So when, uh, for example, you're expecting some logging will start in that particular plot, uh, it's, pos it's possible to set up an alert that will send you um, on a monthly basis the reports about if there is a change or not. The next slide. These were just two cases that where we use the portal and where we saw the portal could be useful for both legal sectors uh, and NGOs to support their campaign to inform better. Um, but the potential applications are great and it uh, really could be integrated in many different uh, chain in environmental law enforcement and compliance monitoring. And we hope that we'll be able to continue develop the ELANS platform to provide with this um, vast amount of data that is easily accessible and wide and that allows the routine use and, uh, and easy uh, to, uh, to use for, uh, for your purposes. Thank you. First, I wanted to thank, of course, to, to all the presenters um, we've heard so far. And uh, we are now transi transitioning towards the uh, concluding part of our webinar, um, where we hope to initiate an exchange on uh, current and potential applications of the ELANS portal. Uh, and of course, um, to discuss how it could serve different groups of users, including law firms, policymakers, law enforcers, governments, um, the civil sector, and so on. Um, I'd like to give the floor first uh, to our discussants uh, to kickstart uh, the discussion by summarizing in uh, two to three minutes their impressions and thoughts related to what we have heard so far. And of course, uh, stemming from their rich experience and wide expertise in this topic. Uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Odin Serrano, representing Earth League International and Countering Wildlife Trafficking Institute. And uh, she will be followed by um, two uh, distinguished uh, guests as well, Professor Richard Lucas from the University of Wales, Aboriswa, uh, and Clive Hufford, uh, Serapia Limited, uh, Chairman of the Euroside Remote Sensing Support Group. Um, please, Dr. Diane Serrano, would you take the floor? Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Hi, I'm Odine Serrano. And yes, as um, Alexandra mentioned, I have a, an organization called the Countering Wildlife Trafficking Institute, but my primary partner is with Earth League International, who is an intelligence agency for Earth. And we conduct um, a variety of analytics, but mainly we're focusing on um, the transnational criminal aspects of um, wildlife trafficking. And uh, Earth League is led by um, Andrea Crosta, and his philosophy is to fight it at the, fight our work at the network level. And so, what we do is we look at the supply chain of, and then the criminal networks, and then the convergence of uh, trafficking with uh, wildlife trafficking and other environmental crimes. And so, my work is to uh, head up the spatial analytic portion of our portfolio, and um, we do is we link the human uh, intelligence, those that are actually in the crimes, with um, with the geospatial locational aspects, and then we inform um, professionals in the in the field of law enforcement and intelligence and other local and governmental uh, local governmental stakeholders. So I was asked to share how we can use the satellite imagery in my work. And so just briefly, there's sort of four steps to the process. So satellite imagery we use to inform us of the landscape changes, which is illegal logging that we just heard about or mining. And then we, uh, we look at the environment, environmental crimes that are related to other uh, other aspects of wildlife trafficking, sort of that convergence of environmental crimes and the networks associated with them. 
And in order to disrupt and address these criminal networks, we need to look at the supply chain through a variety of data sources, including ground and overhead. Then by combining these two sources, it will help um, to steer us to hot spots of where we can focus our ground operations. Um, we can also provide ground truthing from what we see in imagery above. And then finally, some of this data can um, feed our deep learning, machine learning models and artificial intelligence for auto feature, feature extraction from imagery. So just very quickly, three points. First, we'll use the exploration tool to guide us to those indicators um, with the imagery as we learned about today. Our focus is primarily in Latin America and the Americas in general, but focus primarily in Latin America. Then we'll be using the monitoring detection tool to highlight the change detection um, of where these occurrences are through our alert system. And then Finally, the legislative tool will help to guide our analytics where our focus will be and then further how our analytics can support the policies and or laws that are implemented. And so we hope to partner with the ELINS um, team to develop another um, use case for this area in to our organized environmental crimes through our combined analytics of um, ground ops and overhead. And what I mean, by the way, by what I mean by is that we conduct um, undercover operations to understand who these networks are more fully. And that's it. Many thanks, Dr. Serrano. Um, let's now maybe just proceed and, and offer the floor to, to Professor Lucas. Um, Professor Lucas, are you uh, ready and available? Yes, I am, yes. Thank um, you. I Thank you very much. Yes, I'm Richard Lucas at Aberystwyth University, um, and we've been um, developing Living Wales uh, project for um, for national land cover and change monitoring. But it's based on um, very much international collaboration with Europe and also with countries like Australia and so on. Um, I find that the, the 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 portals and the information that was available. Um, was really good in, in the fact that it allowed information to be shared and discussed. And this is very much the ethos that we have as well. But particularly was this ability to access legal documents and other material. I think that's really valuable. And it's, it's something where you, you often have satellite imagery and you see change, but doing something about it and recognizing the importance of that change and, and uh, it is really critical. So that was a very, very valuable. Um, also, you know, we mentioned that linking to other spatial data layers, you know, we'd be certainly be interested to, to work alongside this because, you know, we have our own land cover maps, which do incorporate in Copernicus products. But I think generally, I think people do want to be able to bring in their own information on top of what's been provided here. And, and that's really, really valuable to be able to do that. Um, the, the one I really like is um, the, the alerts is really good. Um, the, it is we we use an evidence base for alerts as well in a similar sort of concept and it would be very interesting to work again alongside there and, and i think it'd be really it's good to have it so it's um fully open ideally so that people can see um you know where, what is happening where and 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 i guess those alerts and um are really valuable because often you can't keep a track of things all the time and and again that's an ethos that i think we we follow um, but I did like those email alerts and being able to track things over time and access to the satellite data. Um, I think the use of the industry standards for the terminology, again, we, we follow that as well. Uh, and, and that is really important so people understand you know, what deforestation is and what do you mean also by the terms that are being produced um, in the platforms. A um, couple of things would be quite useful is it's, it's you know, knowing what the algorithms are for the retrieval of the different, you know, how do you retrieve deforestation? Is it deep learning or, or other ways? Um, and also maybe having access to other different data sets like the radar or you mentioned commercial planet data, which you know, obviously gives you higher resolution and more frequent coverage. So you know, I think there's lots of useful um, ways forward and also bringing in ground data that's commensurate with what you're observing. Um, so yes, overall, I, I think it's a fantastic way forward. It's certainly, it's the legal side and the, the access to those documents and that capacity to understand why um, and what change is happening and, and what to do about that change. And it takes a little bit of the, um, the helplessness away, I guess, from a lot of people. 
Um, I do think the planning is really important um, and what, what people would like to do into the future, sort of knowing what future plans would be. So that development you talked about um, was, was really, if, if those plans are put forward, you could actually have averted any of that damage before it happened. And, and I guess that would be a really good way to sort of try and integrate um, planning um, information from cities and, and national parks and so on. But overall, um, excellent um, a tool, set of tools and a really good ethos as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback. Um, I'm here cognizant of the Q&A uh, box and so far we have no questions asked there. There is one comment in the chat box to which we'll, we can come back later. If you, if you would like to reflect also on, on what we've uh, shared so far, that would be great. Thank you. No, it's uh, really interesting stuff. The, uh, my, my role is, uh, I, I actually work with Professor Lucas on the Living Wells project, but I also chair the uh, remote sensing support group for Eurosite. And the, the aim of that group is to facilitate information exchange between uh, conservation practitioners and remote sensing specialists. And one of the big challenges, of course, is to illustrate how um, remote sensing products and new technologies can be relevant for, for nature conservation. And I, I think there's a huge amount of potential in the eLens portal for informing site managers, uh, the, the focus on forestry operations, uh, the timing of uh, flooding and sort of inundations and frequency of inundations and the timing and uh, the time and frequency of fires. They're all sort of real challenges to conservation managers and the ability to look back in time and to be, you know, to see patterns uh, is also an important tool that hasn't been available. Um, uh, the, it, it's also important that the, uh, the, the tools that you've developed are intuitive and easy to use, and, and they are. Um, it, the, the, I think the open access component of this will also be important, particularly for the conservation agencies or the conservation bodies uh, that typically don't have a huge amount of money. So uh, the frequency of the satellite data and coverage of the satellite data are also sort of key to the availability of this and both the exploration tool and the monitoring tool are you know potentially really important resources for, for conservation managers so we'll be you know as far as i'm concerned we'll be really keen to promote the use of this tool uh, within the sort of remote sensing support group um, the, the way that we intend we intend to operate is to set up um, and establish a, a, a set of hubs throughout Europe uh, where there will be ecologists and remote sensing specialists sort of working together to, um, to facilitate that information exchange. And as I say, that this looks like a really accessible and user-friendly tool that, that could be important for bridging the gap between what conservation managers do on the ground now and the information that's available from remote sensing platforms. So yeah, I think it's an excellent piece of work and will be really useful in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for your, your reflections and, uh, and thoughts. Um, um, I see now that we, we had one uh, question um, incoming from Andrew Muir um, on, on the court proceedings um, as evidence. And if it is, uh, as it is necessary to prove the authenticity and the accuracy of the images. This usually requires the author of the images to testify to their accuracy and authenticity. Will provision be made for this to be done? Second question is uh, on the coding, etc. cetera, um, may be called for so that a uh, defendant can uh, challenge accuracy, authenticity. This is even more, more stringent in criminal trials. I see that Mario um, is already typing an answer, but maybe someone would like to reflect on it um, live here. I see Alexander is un unmuting. Yeah, yes, I, I thank I you. Th thanks, Alexandra. I, I tried to, to briefly touch upon the question of Andrew and, and thanks. And 
obviously this is one of the main main um, future concerns we have to um, use um, invalidance and the O data in court proceedings, but um, this is, and that's what I'm trying to point out, mainly depends on the jurisdiction. Um, we, not, we have not yet identified a common standard um, for, for all of the jurisdictions, of course. Um, we know that some countries are easier or, or have early adopted the EO data or satellite data as, as court um, evidence, others um, not at all, or just um, it is not, not yet a topic. But um, I think your question was, was concerning um, 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 the author of the image and to testify. Um, this is a fair, fair, fair um, comment, and I, I agree. But I would also say that um, the data, and then please Marion and Kristin and Alexander join in, um, the data is based on, on the Sentinel um, data we receive. So we, we're not messing with the data. And what I understood is that um, we do have all data packed into um, the satellite data itself. So this can be verified that this data is actually um, correct, not corrupted and so on. So what we're trying to achieve is to um, establish a system which can be easily transferred to the court um, by backing up the, the images um, by the, the um, let's say, uh, code um, behind it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. And if, if I want to, 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 we already implemented a system that you get the metadata of the data you received. So you uh, get the exact, uh, reference to what was the original data, where it, where we get it from, which time series, which uh, original data from the Copernicus system was used, and also for the future we'll integrate what happened with the data after that exactly, so that it can be reproduced by by Kurt, and that it can serve as an uh, on Kurt as as an evidence. So we are aware that that. It is a big issue and it is really a thing that uh, the, the, the legal system is not prepared at the moment for, for such things. And this is one of the big challenges uh, we discovered during the project that to, to make the possibility to use such informations uh, on CURT would be, and to, to find a solution which is, 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 is suitable for for more than, than one specific case, which would be a general solution for maybe Europe, for example, uh, this would be this is would be a too ambitious goal for this project. It it, it would really be necessary to 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 uh, to make this in on a on a, on a on a on a bigger a bigger thing out of it. And this is one reason we also have produced out of this project that there still are limitations in case of 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 the. The infrastructure of the legal uh, the legal world and how it is working there to really use that and and we want but at least one part of this project is to make <laughs> awareness of that that this is still an issue and there is still work to do it because if we have the information what to do with the data how to to provide that information to make them uh, on on a uh, to bring them on a legal basis we can do it but we still need the regulations for that and, and information on how to do it. Maybe I can um, add to that a little bit. Um, so as Mari said, like one of the aims of this project is also um, to make uh, the legal community and also policy makers, decision makers, to make them feel a little bit more comfortable accessing this type of data and using this type of data, because often what you find is that it's uh, GIS specialists or remote sensing specialists who would deal with satellite data, analyze it, manipulate it, and then present it. Um, but this time around, and this is why DLI Piper and, and IUCN are involved, um, for us, we, we don't usually are the people who, who um, who have direct access to this data. So for us, it's really interesting to see to get comfortable with using it and then to identify how can we incorporate it into our work uh, from a legal perspective uh, in, in a private law firm, but also more from the not-for-profit uh, sector perspective as well.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine, Mario, and Alexander. Um, we have no more uh, questions um, uh, posted um, so far. Uh, and I think um, unless someone uh, raises uh, their hand uh, in the next few seconds, I think we can uh, proceed slowly to closing uh, the webinar. Um, uh, allow me to take the opportunity um, again to, to thank all the panelists and invited experts for uh, their participation and of course to all of you for taking the time to join us. Um, I trust that we have all learned something. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot and I hope that you found the results that we've presented and the potential of and violence um, and its portal inspiring and informative as well as potentially useful. Um, we, we are very proud to demonstrate how the ELANS uh, breaks down the barriers related to access to satellite data by non-Earth observation experts. Um, the two powerful examples uh, that we shared prove that by relying on Earth observation data, facilitating the access to satellite imagery and its understanding, um, ELANS could be a part of the solution when it comes to the major global challenges we are facing today. Once again, let me thank the European Union for supporting ELANS on behalf of the partners and for making um, the webinar today possible. And let us keep the communication channels open. We are accessible by email or uh, via the social media. And uh, before uh, wishing you a nice rest of the day and thanking you for your attention, I will launch a quick um, poll here um, in, in Zoom and uh, would appreciate those of you who still have a, a minute to give us a feedback related to today's session. Um, thank you very much and um, have a nice uh, rest of the day.